start of today's proceedings, let me introduce you to our first interviewer. Skilled not only with his words, but also with his hands, this protractor is known as the Tiens at Ferret. And of course, as the beloved president of the Energetical Society. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Abit and Rajiv on stage. And now, for the moment we've all been waiting for, the first of the four eminent personalities who will grace the stage today. Please put your hands together in welcoming the nightingale of the medical panel, Lambo, Dr. Nilanka Jitramasi. Lecturer from the Department of Physiology, avid researcher in the fields of immunology, nutrition, and GI physiology, wife mother, musician, just a few of the labels that describe this multifaceted individual. She received the gold medal for the best student of the PJIM for the postgraduate certificate and diploma category in 2019. She has received the presidential awards for scientific publication twice in 2014 and 2015 and the merit award in 2016. Having been born into a musical family, she started off with the piano and then also received vocal training. Today, she holds an ATCL in piano performance and an LTCL in vocal performance. To uncover more about her or inspiring life, let us welcome onto the stage Dr. Nilanka Vikramasinghe. Dr. Nilanka is one of the pair, and I'm sure all of you have already guessed who we are ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the multi-talented and multi-faceted Dr. Dakshika Vikramasinghe on stage to compete with the power couple. Lecturer from the Department of Surgery, whose ideas and principles in life have enabled him to reach great heights of life. He graduated with first class honors from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo in 2009 while topping his batch and receiving five distinctions and seven medals. Dr. Dakshita Vikramasinghe was an all-rounder who was also awarded University Colors for tennis. He went on to receive further prestigious accolades during his postgraduate training at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine as well. Surgeon, lecturer, sportsman, husband, and a father. His journey is an insight into leading a well balanced life for all of us who wish to enter the chaotic medical sphere in the future. With that, we welcome Dr. Dakshita Vikramasinghe on stage. Before I hand over controls to our interviewer, let me inform the audience that they will have an opportunity to ask questions to the interviewer, interviewees at the end of the interview. So get your questions ready. And with that, let me hand over controls to our interviewer. Over to you, Abhin. Thank you, Ashley. Good evening, sir. Good evening, madam. Thank you for joining us here today by taking time off your very busy schedules. <laughs> so, now as medical students, we have the great privilege of learning from the professionals themselves rather than simply lecturers. But even though we speak to our lecturers on a daily basis, we simply know them as our lecturers. We don't know anything beyond their role as teachers. So today, in Insights to Inspire 2.0, that is what we aim to do, break this barrier between student and lecturer and aim to gain insight into their lives. So, as Julie Andrews would say, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. <laughs> let's start off with their childhood. Shall we start with Madam? Okay. Uh, you want me to talk about my childhood? Yes. So, uh, I had a very loving, uh, an incredibly supportive family. And uh, because you all are focusing on music, I will say that it's a very musical family. Uh, my father was a doctor, and uh, we, uh, childhood-wise, uh, uh, 
uh, he owned a small uh, private hospital. And uh, it's, it's not ours anymore. So, childhood wise, I actually lived on top of a hospital. Our, the part, uh, our annex or apartment was on top of the hospital. So, I was actually living on top of the hospital. And annex or apartment was on top of the hospital. And after that, uh, my father was also a musician. Uh, he was a, a good singer and a good pianist. So, he and his brothers, they had their own band called the Jigsaws and they toured around Sri Lanka. The next time they are the university. So that so we had the hospital background and then we had the music background. And in fact in our living room, uh, I think I would have shown a picture in it. with my father the background. That was our living room. We had a small stage built in the living room with musical instruments and drums and uh, organs and what. So every time someone comes, guess who would be singing to them? <laughs> So it was a slightly embarrassing childhood, but um, it's, uh, so that music and uh, me living in that medical background inspired me to become a doctor as well as inspired me to uh, music and singing. And, uh, you want me to speak more? <laughs> I can go on. Uh, so, and also I trained. Uh, when I was about five years old, I was put on singing classes and music classes by my mother. Uh, I think I will talk about this to you. Uh, my mother had this idea. Uh, there is a book, uh, Pride and Prejudice, by uh, Jane Austen. So there is a sentence in that uh, where they talk about an accomplished woman. And in that, uh, it says that an accomplished woman should. I can't move word by word, but it said that an accomplished woman should have a lot of things to manage. So I think my mother took that literally to her heart and uh, took me to all the classes she could think of. So from ballet classes to uh, dancing classes, art classes. So from small days she took me to all the classes. The only classes which stuck to me were the music classes. And uh, so I did my singing. And music, uh, piano lessons, and exams from a small age until so my child was. Right. I think that's enough. <laughs> so, yeah, I think you get an insight into what your child has been, and you said you lived right here at Puchu Mohalla, right in the vicinity. I was the closest to that, but it should be at the time. So, did that play a part? Uh, we had a lot of parties at home, a lot of people crashed at our home. But other than that, that was, <laughs> that was no particular <laughs> So now, can we hear about Sir? Sir's childhood? So, yes, um, uh, I'm a rich child. I did not have the luxury of. Uh, I did not have the luxury of uh, being close to school. I schooled at Nalanda, which is again hop, step and a way. So I schooled at Nalanda, which is again hop, step and a way from here. But I lived in the when I was schooling. Uh, so we, very different. So I used to, I had to leave home by about 6, 15, 6, then I got to school. Uh, but uh, from my uh, young school days, uh, other than academic, I used to try to at least try and explore different things, uh, sports, other extracurricular activities. Uh, not necessarily looking at uh, succeeding in anything, but at least as an experience, uh, which also later lets you figure out what you actually like. If you don't try, you will never know whether you like it, or more importantly, whether you will not like it before, uh, until you commit to it. So I tried a lot of things, extracurricular activities, sports, societies, uh, and with time to do levels, A levels, and I did but mainly sports while I played tennis as a serious sport at school. Uh, tried my hand at cricket and athletics, didn't really, uh, couldn't really come to uh, three sports, and uh, also I wanted to get into music and. Uh, the band, but unfortunately the way it stood in my school, the band was to, was the cadet band and I could not commit myself to becoming a cadet, putting five 
weekday afternoons into that practice, so I had to give, give up on that. Uh, so, yes, that's about me and school life and young life. Unfortunately, not musical at all. <laughs> so, yeah. So, building on that, how do you think uh, the fact that you did extracurricular activities in any case has helped you up to now? I think activities are very important for a number of reasons. One, they are, as the name suggests, extracurricular. So, in other than your curricular activities, it lets you compartmentalize these activities and have dedicated time. Which in my case was useful because, say, an exam comes near, you know that there are things that you can cut down on and create time for your academic work. And I think uh, one thing that really worked for me in my school days and later on in faculty was uh, time management. If you really need to manage your time, whether you are doing no extracurricular activities or 10, uh, because that is how at the end of the day you are going to get things done. Unfortunately, this is going to sound like the TV interview of a scholarship island first. You need to do your daily studies every day and uh, not, not eat in the day. But unfortunately, that's, well, that is how I work and that is what has worked for me. And not only me, that is, how, that is what I have seen has worked for a lot of people who succeeded. Not only academically, in uh, uh, other things as well. And uh, when we were talking about what we were to talk about, uh, I, I said, I'll uh, bring up a concept uh, about education. I don't know how many of you have heard of Anders Ericsson. He is an educationist who, who spoke and who popularized this term uh, 10,000 hours. Actually came up in somebody came up in uh, a book which uh, made it more popular than the actual paper itself. But basically, for you to be good at anything, you need to put ten thousand hours. I, I always repeat this to the professorial group that comes uh, to us. So the only way you are going to put ten thousand hours in these five years is if you put two thousand hours in each year, which is about somewhere between five and six hours every day of deliberate practice. Not easy, uh, but also not impossible. But, and and that, that is for anything, not, not just school. If you want to be good at playing a music instrument or a sport, look at most of just about every, well, every person, Anders Ericsson style, yeah, including <coughs> professional golfers and tennis players, you're looking at 10,000 hours minimum. Uh, so, Yes, so extracurricular activities help me in a way that it helped me from a very young age to uh, manage my time, to allocate time for each thing so that I could then juggle this around when there was a need. And, and that is something you do even now. There are certain things you need to actually cut down and say, okay, for the month of December I'm not doing A, B and C because I need to focus on something else. And that will be, especially for now, for you, now that uh, the exam structure is different, that's going to be very useful. So, yeah, um, what you can see is you did a lot of extracurricular activities, but they didn't impinge on your academic work, but rather help, you know, learn soft skills such as time management and so on. So, yeah, so now we'll move on to Madam. Can I really yes. to yes. what he said? Uh, regarding extracurricular activities, we have this idea that, okay, I'm so now, let's say, maybe that's because I sang from a young age. But uh, we, I, I don't know, this would sound a bit weird, uh, we will talk about the cream of the cream of the cream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we here are uh, all graduates of, uh, of uh, the university system, and I believe we can estimate our IQ level to be around 135, 140. <laughs> the average IQ is around 100. That's what they say. That's what Wikipedia is like uh, looking at. So, when you have a kind of a high IQ, okay, uh, all of us here, um, I don't know whether there are people who came from other pathways, but <laughs> um, uh, our cerebral capacity is enough to do other extracurricular activities well. So, for example, music, literature, arts, everything. Um, we can uh, beat our high IQ 
can do those things. Unfortunately, not everyone does that from a young age. Now, I had the opportunity of being exposed to that through my parents. But sometimes we see students who can never sing a song and they come here and discover that they have great talent. So our high IQ helps us to build on those talents. So another thing we talked about was that we tried everything. So I believe that in faculty you are in your 20s, this is your glorious years where you have, you are an adult, but you still don't have a family to support. So you are quite <laughs> independent. You should pick, you should try everything. Just don't uh, think about what other people will think. Now she's singing, she's doing that, she's doing this. Just don't care about what other people think. Try everything. There's no harm in trying. It helps you develop your brain further. And with your high IQ, you can compensate. So I'm sure a lot of you here who listen to their talents, they are great singers, they are great violinists, pianists, you are part of yourself. And then uh, there are great athletes, you are talking about Akira. Right? So our the, uh, high IQ can compensate for the lack of natural talent sometimes. I don't know whether that makes sense. So if you are playing cricket, if you are not a natural born cricketer, with your high IQ, you can, you know, get your ankles and, you know, cricket returns and enhance it further. So we should not just think only about academics, but also think about extra factors and enhance these things. So I think that was really insightful in the fact that we have to try out everything that's available to us. You don't necessarily have to succeed. You might be the worst at it. <laughs> but the point is to try and you might end up liking something. So yeah, talking about liking things, we'll move on to the next question. I know this is directed at both of you, although they are separate questions. Um, for Madam, why nutrition and physiology? And for Sir, why surgery? <laughs> Interesting. How, I don't know how many of you have thought about what you want to be or do at the end of your know, five years, or at least uh, what direction your career might take. Uh, I myself, at least as a child, I don't think I ever thought of myself as becoming a doctor. My parents, whenever my relatives or parents used to ask me, I said, I want to be a scientist. I thought I didn't like, I didn't like the idea of doing medicine and then somehow my uh, parents managed to convince me that being a doctor is like being a scientist plus <laughs> I still don't know how they managed to convince me but they So here I am. Uh, so how did I decide uh, what I do? So some of them were by exclusion. So I know there are some areas of medicine I would not do even that was the only left job left in this world. I'd rather move out of the medicine. Uh, uh, again, to be very philosophical, uh, there's this Japanese concept called Ikigai. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Basically, it is about how you choose what you're going to do. Basically, it is about what you like, what you're good at, what you can get paid, and what the world needs. If you can find something that where all of four, those four things merge, that's perfect. That's going to be a, that's going to be a sweet spot. If you can find three and let go of the least important thing of those four, that's still quite an achievement. But basically, that's what has helped me, or that's what I did when I uh, thought of what I want to do. So basically, I wanted something that dealt with patience and something that was exciting. So uh, needed something clinical. Also needed some adventure and adrenaline rush, so I knew it was going to be surgery or genomes. Uh, medicine maybe, not so much. Pediatrics definitely no. <laughs> so uh, apologies, I, uh, this is not nothing to do with the speciality itself. But they say uh, veterinary science and pediatrics are the same. You can't get a history from the patient. <laughs> so, I don't want to get an email tomorrow from my professor of pediatrics. Uh, so I, I didn't like pediatrics for whatever reason. I also didn't like a lot of paraclinical sciences. I didn't see myself sitting behind a, a bench. Uh, so basically by exclusion for most parts and then uh, looking at what would give me an adrenaline hit, I ended up in surgery. 
So uh, just shows how different we are. Uh, I did not like my clinicals at all. I, I don't like patients. <laughs> I don't like going for ward rounds. I don't like standing until my varicose veins from my genital cell. I don't like the sweat, the blood, the urine stage. So I definitely knew from the response I went to the final year, okay, this is not me, you are going to go behind a bench. <laughs> and that's what I like, an easy room where I can control my subjects, you know, do research, and that's why I joined nutrition physiology. Uh, where, and I see patients also, I go to national hospital, I see patients like once a day, but that's enough, you know, enough because <laughs> enough patients to keep me like geared as a doctor, enough, but enough to keep my comfort level up. So that's how I ended up uh, going to that part. So it's interesting to see how two different people can have two different approaches to the same topic that is choosing their final specialty. So yeah. So moving on, um, when I spoke to Sir the other day, he had a lot to say about extracurricular activities. But of course, um, building a CV and you know getting research done and uh, moving forwards in life. So you said earlier that the skills you acquired from doing extracurricular activities helped you go a long way with these things. So how do those two tie in? As in grabbing the opportunities when they're presented to you, and how these skills helped you? latch on to these opportunities and not let go. Trying to structure my answer. Uh, okay, so if you think about the average medical graduate of this country, I think there are a few countries where everybody who graduates is guaranteed a job. The downside of that is that most of you will never have to face a competitive interview ever in your life. Unless you are going into academia or you are going to leave the country and go for a job elsewhere. Uh, as soon as you get employed by the Ministry of Health, none of your promotions will require an interview. So, not many people have this idea of developing their CV. Because it's not really different unless you are looking at something else. But I think, I, all, I, I said earlier that you need to experience different things and at least try and explore different things. But always start with the end in mind. If you think that you might be interested in pursuing a career in research, or academia, or even otherwise, use every opportunity you get to experience different things and build your CV. And CV and don't go with the idea that your potential recruiter or the employer is only interested in qualifications and papers or, or certificates. Most people are now looking at soft skills, whether you've done extracurricular activities, whether you've been in team sports, whether you've done other things and being part of a team. That's very important. That's often a place where a lot of doctors go wrong. They can't they are not geared to working uh, as a part of a team. They are used to working alone, which at least in the this is the work. Uh, and you talk about research. I think there are lots of opportunities. I understand the undergraduate curriculum is very stressful. You sometimes wonder whether you have even enough time, which, by the way, I don't know whether you've seen the national quality uh, framework. They cannot calculate the number of credit hours for the MBBS. So we have calculated it for engineering, they have calculated it for science. For all four year courses and honor, uh, honors courses, they have calculated it. They have calculated it for the preclinical MBBS. But as soon as we add our lectures and our uh, clinicals, it goes beyond the recommended hours of, uh, that, uh, uh, of notational credit hours. <laughs> So, remember the MBBS is so stressful and so intense that the value cannot be calculated according to the recommended uh, calculations. So, uh, despite that, there is always opportunity. I, uh, something I am very glad that I, <coughs> one of our seniors told me 
in my first year was, remember you are going to be here for five years. If you think about that, that's going to be like three years in O levels and two years in A levels. Imagine yourself from grade 9 to grade 13, that is the time that you are going to spend in faculty. If you think back, you are never going to remember what you did for your school classes in school from O levels and A levels, but you will remember all the good times you had. And that is what very soon after you graduate, that is what you could remember. So, take it in that context, but also use it to build your CV. If you are interested in research, there are lots of <coughs> sorry, opportunities around in the faculty, there are lots of people doing good research, uh, and you can easily go and join one of those teams. But again, remember, this is an almost, it's certainly not a curricular activity, it's probably co curricular and remember, it's only going to be the icing on your cake, not the cake. You must first have a cake to have the icing. <laughs> Where a lot of people go wrong is that they get engrossed in this idea of icing the cake, but they actually don't have much of a cake when it comes to uh, the end of the program. So, while emphasizing the importance of co-curricular and extracurricular activities, I cannot emphasize it enough that you need to focus on your studies uh, because Remember, at the end of the day, you are here as a medical student, not paying virtually, virtually paying nothing for your course fee, uh, where the state is funding you. So you have at least that commitment to succeed in your education and co-curricular research activities, plus or minus four. Remember, take part in everything. Uh, I remember. So the six years I was in faculty, except for the prof, yeah, I was there for all five colors. In fact, uh, uh, when we were in faculty, the majority of colors, the entire orchestra was from our batch, almost. Uh, and all of those things carry. And uh, you now, since we're talking about university awards, there are sets of there are sets of awards. There is a set of awards that the university gives by open application. Akila's one was the student of the year, again by open application, which they consider. And they are looking at all of these things. And uh, I was lucky to get one of those. And if you look at the, uh, the, the marking scheme they have, they talk about these things. Uh, uh, social activities, uh, capacity building, uh, charity, etc. So, to basically summarize, start with the end in mind. And there are opportunities all around you. Just keep your eyes open. So I think the take-home message from what Sir said now is that you cannot have icing alone for dessert. <laughs> you need to have the cake first, but you also need to have your eyes peeled so that you can ice the cake and also have the cherry on top. <laughs> so moving on to the next question to Madam. So um, in this faculty, we encounter various different types of lecturers and there are various different types of teaching. So having been to your lectures, your lectures stand out in the fact the way you approach your lectures and how you inculcate a story into it and the visual imagery you use. And we are also extremely grateful for the numerous breaks you have in between. <laughs> so where do you think this stems from? Do you have any sort of inspiration behind this unique style of teaching? Actually, the inspiration is me. <laughs> Uh, unlike he, again, two totally different personalities, right? Uh, he does regulars. He talked about regulars. I'm the type who cramp just before an exam, <laughs> uh, or just before a deadline. Uh, so the inspiration, and um, he is very good at looking at books and research, and you know, reading. Even when I'm bored, he will be looking at some, you know, research articles. So I'm not like that. I'm more of a what you call an audio-visual learner. So even during faculty, I studied from YouTube videos, by teaching others. So for me, seeing uh, writing on a lecture slide kind of puts me off because you know I can't read. I, I for now, even now I cannot read the Roman numerals of a clock. I mean, if you have the clock in Roman numerals, I can't read the time. And if you don't have any. Uh, some, there are some clocks with no uh, numbers, I get totally lost. Right? So, uh, visual imagery is the way I learn. And, I, and for me, that's the way I like to teach. 
and uh, to tell a story. So I put a lot of hours to my lectures. So I think I'm having a lecture for your on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I spent close to about five to ten working days, whole working days, from Hewlett CD, making that lecture. Uh, I mean, you might be thinking it's unnecessary, but it's just for one hour. But for me, uh, it's about making a story and getting that into our brain. Um, look here, you hear it. The lecture is going to be hearing. I can't remember a thing which I learned about hearing and during my first trip. Right? No one's going to ask you to remember the potassium going in and out. But what you need to know is the philosophy behind it. But, you know, what, but someone asks you what is hearing, you've got to tell how do you hear. You have to tell it in terms a lay person can understand. If you have to get that at least. You don't need to know about the potassium to tell to the lay person, but at least to explain that, you have to get an idea about it. So, uh, that's how I think about it and create that story. So I think all my batchmates here are certainly looking forward to Thursday's lecture now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, moving on, out of all the eight lecturers we will be interviewing for insights, what's special about the two of you is that, of course, you are a couple. <laughs> it would be weird if both of us were not married. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did the two of you meet and how did that go to where you are today? I will grab the mic first. <laughs> Because we have conflicting theories about how I make your mother. He says that I went after him. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, I, I, I was the one who sent the first Facebook request, yes. <laughs> but uh, I, he was the one who came after me. <laughs> and he was a demo during Prozen Adadeva's period. And I was a first year when I first met. Uh, it, was a, it was a long, complicated story. We are hoping to sell the rights to a Hindi movie. You want to tell more? You would, or we could guess us side of the story as well. We'll stick with that version of the story. But yeah, so like I actually said, uh, and since we are in the business of uh, insightful uh, talking and inspiring, uh, so like uh, so we met uh, when I was a demonstrator and she was in first year. Uh, and uh, our families are family friends. Uh, but then for some reason, then her parents didn't like the affair. Then they, they were okay, then my parents didn't like the fact. <laughs> so eventually they came to one of those places where the frequencies of both families matched. <laughs> and then uh, it was a thing. So that's how it happened. Because now this is to inspire them. <laughs> uh, on a serious note, uh, both of us are two different personalities, very different personalities. Right? He would be OCD. I would be bipolar, if we were characterizing the And you might think like previously in my couch and we are, you know, it's all all the time hundred percent. It's not, right? We have our disagreements, we have our agreements. It's majority agreements. So what I would like to tell future couples here, or, you know, few <laughs> things here, is that uh, uh, even though you have different personalities, you can come to like what is a sweet spot where you are, uh, where you complement each other. So I, he puts what you call a, uh, he regularizes my kind of haywire thinking, and I add excitement to his life. Like <laughs> <So laughs> my haywire kind of thing. So uh, when you are looking for partners. And eventually, I'm sure you know, you're at the age of looking for partners, or must have found someone. So just uh, don't try to have this uh, checklist. I want a boy who's like this, 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 who's matched this, this, this. Just be open and uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, stay with them for some time. Uh, as in, since 
I am deviating from the topic, but just don't fall in love at first sight immediately. You've got to do some teamwork with them. I think that's why extracurricular activities can help, right? So you know whether this person, you know, does, does the work he's supposed to do, helps with um, teamwork, because you, you have to have a partner who's a team worker. So, uh, if you're trying to find your partner from faculty, I think you have to think of a person who's you know, involved in all of this and who's not selfish. So, I hope I make sense. <laughs> Just to add uh, something to that, uh, the time we actually started going out and uh, going out in public, none of my batchmates and none of her batchmates believe that we are a couple. <laughs> Way in the past. <laughs> <laughs> They're so whole opposite of personalities that uh, they didn't believe that we were going on. So yeah, I was about to ask the power couple for relationship advice, but of course, Madam has read my mind and beat me to it. So yeah, I hope all the couples in the audience here took notes. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this very enlightening interview. I would like to thank the both of you again from the bottom of my heart for joining us here today and enlightening all of us and of course for the very valuable relationship advice. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Abhinav. Words of gratitude fall short when conveying our thanks to our lecturers who took their time off to be with us today. So thank you, sir, madam. And now for the interesting part. As was evident in our interview, music is a part and parcel of Dr. Nibankar's life. And I would now like to invite her to perform a small song for our audience. Over to you, madam. So uh, I think the people in the choir must be knowing this. This is the song uh, I sang at my wedding with that shadow. <laughs> He's a bit shy to bring his guitar today, so uh, I'll be going to come to the <laughs> 